Well, another quarter has rolled by, and that means we have a brand new batch of 13F filings from some of our favorite super investors. These filings every single quarter tell us which stocks basically some of our favorite investors own and have been buying and selling. Anyone that manages more than $100 million in assets has to file one of these with the SEC, and it allows us to dig into some of the latest moves of investors like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Monish Pabrai, and many more. I try to do these videos every single quarter and as usual we'll go through some of the normal culprits like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Monish Pabrai, Guy Spear and so on but I'll also uh, as usual add in a new super investor towards the end of the video that I haven't covered on the channel before. So if you enjoyed this video and haven't subscribed to the Investing with Tom channel already please be sure to do so but without further ado let's get straight into some of these latest moves from our favorite super investors. Now let's kick things off with the big dog of course Warren Buffett at Berkshire. Hathaway. Now with uh, Berkshire specifically, but really with all of these 13F filings, there are a few things to keep in mind. Now the 13F is on a 45 day delay. So these holdings are actually as of the end of December 2022. So they could definitely have changed between uh, the end of December 2022 and when I record this video and when the 13F data comes out. But they should give us a pretty good idea of the stocks, particularly that very long term investors like Warren Buffett uh, plan to own for a long time. The other thing to keep in mind across the board here is that these are only long positions in US stocks. So uh, shares that these investors just own straight up in US companies. It's not going to show us any international holdings. It's not going to show us how much cash they have sitting on the sidelines. And it's not going to show us any short positions or, or anything like that. Um, and specifically with Berkshire and Warren Buffett, which is the first one we'll look at, uh, Berkshire Hathaway isn't only only managed by Warren Buffett if we look up right at the top end of his 13F filing with the very largest investments. Those are almost certain to be Warren Buffett stock picks, but he also has Todd Combs and Ted Weschler, who manage smaller amounts of money in the Berkshire portfolio. So generally speaking, the larger big positions are likely to be Buffett, and the smaller positions are likely to be Ted or Todd, although we don't know for certain. And although, like I said, the 13F does only give us data on US stock positions, there are occasionally other regulatory filings that invest investors have to file in different countries with their non-US investments. Now, uh, I use a site called Ticker to look through some of those filings. It collates them really nicely. So for each of the investors that I cover in this video, I will also have a look over at Ticker to see if there's any uh, international regulatory filing activity and any international stocks that these investors have bought. It certainly won't pick up every international stock, that is for sure. But if an investor buys, for example, 5% of a Japanese company, which Buffett and Berkshire way have done uh, over the past couple of years that happens to trigger a local regulatory filing in Japan which would then show up on ticker and we can see which stock that Buffett might have bought in Japan. So with all of that preamble out of the way, let's look through uh, firstly the top 10 positions at Berkshire, which make up the vast majority of Buffett's um, portfolio at Berkshire Hathaway, and some of the latest moves that have happened in those top 10 stocks. So the number one position remains Apple. He added uh, 333,000 shares to that position, which is less than a 1% change. Uh, next up we have Bank of America, that represents about 11% of the portfolio, no change at all. Uh, Chevron, one of the two big oil stocks that Buffett has been buying a lot of in the, in the past year, was actually trimmed very slightly, about 1%. Uh, Coca-Cola, a very long time position, remains unchanged at number four in the portfolio. Uh, same goes for American Express, Kraft Heinz, Occidental Petroleum and Moody's. We then have about a 12% trim to Activision Blizzard, which follows a 12% trim last quarter as well. I followed uh, the Activision kind of story with Buffett reasonably closely here on the channel. So check out some recent videos on that if you're interested. And rounding out the top 10 positions is HP, which again is unchanged. And it's worth noting that by the time we get down to the number 10 position, we're only talking about 0.94% of the US stock portfolio. Uh, it really is very top heavy. So Apple, for example, represents 38.9% of the pie. 
So all in all, relatively minor changes in the stocks that still remain in the top 10 for Buffett, but we did have two very notable changes uh, that were previous top 10 holdings for Berkshire. The number one that really jumps out to me this quarter is actually a complete sale, or near enough complete sale, a uh, trimmed at 86% in Taiwan Semiconductor. This was a brand new position for Buffett last quarter, uh, and last quarter it represented about 1.4% of the portfolio, which uh, again, because the portfolio is so top heavy, that actually ranked it pretty highly for Berkshire. Uh, that's been trimmed all the way down to only 0.2% of the portfolio. So out of character in some respects to see Buffett turn around and trim a relatively large position so quickly, but clearly he's reversed course on that. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him trim that all the way in the next quarter. It does take some time for Buffett to get in and out of stock since he's kind of moving so much money, um, but a really surprising change in the portfolio with the Taiwan Semiconductor sale. The other fairly notable sale is in US Bancorp that was previously about a 1% position as well. Uh, he's trimmed at 91% in the last quarter to where it's now only 0.1% of the portfolio. And again, since it takes Buffett so long to get in and out, I wouldn't be overly surprised to see him ditch US Bancorp altogether. He's steadily been selling out of most of the bank stocks over the past year or so, uh, notably Wells Fargo as well. Although that said, Bank of America does still remain his second largest position. Now I won't go through every single stock in the Berkshire portfolio because there's about 50 of them um, but I will work through the list and just note some of the other sales and purchases that have happened and just keep in mind that again the further down this list I go the more and more likely it is that we're talking about Todd Combs Ted Weschler stocks as opposed to um, the big multi 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 billion dollar positions that are likely to be Buffett. So uh, if we go down to the 14th largest position which is Kroger uh, that was trimmed very slightly less than a 1% trim. We have Paramount Global, which has been increasingly added to by Berkshire over the past year or so. Uh, it was added to another 2%, and although it's only about half a percent of Berkshire's overall US stock portfolio, uh, they're so big that they now actually own over 15% of the entire Paramount Global business. So very interesting to see them take uh, such a large stake in Paramount. If I had to guess, I would say it's likely to be probably a Ted Weschler pick, that one. Uh, he's talked in the past about wanting to take reasonable ownership percentages in an overall company, not necessarily to be an activist in the business, but to have, you know, some sort of influence were he to talk to management and, and that type of thing. Uh, and he also used to have a long time holding and I believe direct TV, which um, again is a kind of an, an adjacent business to what Paramount is doing. If we continue working down some of the changes, we have a 59% trim in Bank of New York Mellon a 10% trim in McKesson Corp, a very small reduction, less than 1% in Ally Financial, which is another one of these businesses that, though it's a small holding for Berkshire relative to their overall portfolio, uh, they own a pretty big chunk of the company, just a slither under 10%. I suspect that trim is actually from uh, a lot of the buybacks that Ally Financial has been doing. That's probably pushing Berkshire's um, overall ownership up close to the 10% threshold, at which point they would have to become a bank holding company, which Warren Buffett has talked about uh, for a long time as, as something that they they don't want to do. That's not a regulatory kind of zone they want to get into. So I suspect similar to what they've done with the likes of Wells Fargo in the past, they're just slowly selling little bits at a time to stay under that 10% threshold with Ally. And the final change here in the Berkshire portfolio is that Louisiana Pacific Corp was added to 21% tiny position. Uh, it went from 0.1% of the portfolio to 0.14. Um, but that is kind of all the adjustments to the portfolio that Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett, Todd Combs and Ted Weschler have made in the last quarter. If we jump over to ticker for Berkshire Hathaway, there's not too much to write home about. The only non-US stock that's currently showing up with some sort of recent activity is IAG, the Australian insurance company. Uh, that was a 0.1% position in the portfolio. So again, very, very small and no change in shareholding since uh, mid-2022. However, if we jump across to one of Berkshire's subsidiaries, Berkshire Hathaway Energy Company, um, they actually do have one single investment, which is in the Chinese EV company, BYD. BYD has been a huge home run for Berkshire over the past 10 years or so, and we've finally started to see them sell down some of their holding in that stock. So the latest data for BYD I can see in ticker is actually a little more recent than the 13 
18Fs being the end of December, uh, and that's telling me that on the 2nd of February 2023, uh, they had trimmed their shares by a little under 8%. So uh, the overall position is now worth about $4 billion. Okay, so moving along now to Warren Buffett's right-hand man, of course, being Charlie Munger. Uh, Charlie Munger manages the portfolio of the Daily Journal Corporation, which allows us to see uh, some of his activity. And this is the portfolio in which uh, Charlie Munger has uh, quite publicly bought Alibaba over the past uh, one to two years. Now, uh, true to Charlie Munger fashion, we don't see a lot of activity in this uh, quarter's filing. The largest positions by far and away are Bank of America and Wells Fargo. They are 43% and 37% of the portfolio respectively. Um, but we then have Alibaba and US Bancorp and all of those positions have had no change at all. The only change that we do see is a complete sale of POSCO that was previously a very, very small investment for the Daily Journal Corporation. It was about 0.22% of the portfolio and it's just been eliminated altogether. Now Daily Journal likely has a position in some international stocks, uh, most notably BYD, again, similar to Berkshire. Uh, Munger has mentioned that a few times in some of the Daily Journal annual meetings, but the position is not large enough to warrant any sort of regulatory filing. So uh, all we have on the DJ Co portfolio activity front is just those stocks that uh, are listed in the 13F. Okay, moving along now to Guy Spear of Aquamarine Capital. Now, Guy Spear is building quite the reputation for being the master of doing nothing, <laughs> much like uh, the man who he looks up to a lot, of course, Charlie Munger. And uh, Guy Spear kind of continued to build that reputation this quarter with absolutely no portfolio activity. So I won't go through the full portfolio, but uh, the top five positions here for Guy Spear remain Berkshire Hathaway, American Express, Bank of America, MasterCard, and Ferrari. Uh, additionally, he has uh, the Class A shares of Berkshire. So if you add those two stocks together, the Class A and the Class B shares, you get to north of 30% of the US portfolio. Now, it seems to be a bit of a trend here, but Guy Spear does actually also have a position in BYD, which I understand at least at the end of last year to be a similar sort of size to the Berkshire position. So this 13F definitely isn't the full picture, um, but there's not a whole lot of activity to kind of read into from Guy Spear this quarter. If we look over at Ticker, we see two additional uh, international stocks and the same theme applies here. No changes at all, uh, but those two investments remain Indian Energy Exchange and ITEC AB. Moving next to a good friend of Guy Spear, that is of course Monish Pabrai of Pabrai Investment Funds. And uh, Monish Pabrai does have a lot of international stocks. So when we look at his 13F here, it looks very concentrated. Uh, it's really not the full picture, but there is some interesting stuff going on with Monish Pabrai's US stock picks this quarter. So uh, the top position remains Micron, that has been the top US stock for some time. It was added to about 2% and is now 77% of the the US portfolio, like I say, that is really not the full picture. Pabrai has said multiple times he tends to limit his investments to about 10% of the portfolio at cost. So to see Micron up there at 77%, uh, that's a vast overstatement of how big that position really is in Pabrai's overall portfolio, but it certainly makes up a big chunk of the US stock. Following Micron, we have two sort of uh, linked or intertwined stocks. Those are Brookfield Corporation and Brookfield Asset Management. Now, um, one of these stocks showed up in Pabrai's portfolio last quarter and that was added to about 219%. And uh, in the 13F data at least, Brookfield Asset Management is showing up as a brand new position. Now, uh, that's true in some ways and it's untrue in others. Um, Brookfield Asset Management is actually a spin-off of the Brookfield Corporation. So Brookfield Corporation shareholders actually uh, kind of got given Brookfield Asset Management shares. Um, Brookfield wanted to split off their asset management business separate to uh, their other businesses with real estate investments and uh, private equity and countless other things. So that looks to be what Pabrai got into this investment for. So although it's showing up as sort of a new purchase here with Brookfield Asset Management, 
that was almost certainly acquired through the spin-off out of the original Brookfield company. So it will be quite interesting to see how Pabrai now handles those sort of two positions in the portfolio, whether he continues just to treat them as one, whether he exits, or whether he wants to concentrate his uh, portfolio into just one of the two. It will be quite interesting to see how that plays out. Um, but those now represent about 18.5 and 4.2% of the portfolio, respectively. Uh, and the last one I'll mention just very quickly is Seritage Growth Properties. Pabrai has largely exited Seritage, and he did that a while back, but but for whatever reason, uh, he seems to have this very tiny little kind of tracker position in the portfolio of about $40,000, you know, relative to the hundreds of millions he's managing. It's it's nothing, um, but we saw no change in the Seritage investment. Jumping over to Ticker, we see quite a few international holdings for Pabrai. We've got uh, Nice Holdings Co., Racist Logistics, Edelweiss Financial, uh, Suntech Realty, and Rain Industries. The only one really that has some recent portfolio activity activity is with uh, Racist Logistics. We have an update there from the 23rd of January this year, uh, but it was a change in shares of two. So um, Pabrai apparently has about uh, almost 75 million shares, and for whatever reason, he sold two of them. I don't exactly know what's going on there, whether that's some sort of glitch in the data here or whether he actually sold two shares, but next to no change and uh, really no recent changes in those other international holdings. Moving along now to Li Lu of Himalaya Capital. Uh, Li Lu, of course, uh, one of the only money managers, at least up until quite recently, uh, that had managed money for Charlie Munger. Uh, Charlie Munger's actually recently put some family money into an Australian uh, investment fund, but for a long time it has really just been Li Lu at Himalaya Capital. And uh, Li Lu has quite a bit of his assets uh, outside of the US, similar to Monish Pabrai. Uh, in the case of Li Lu, it's very likely focused predominantly in China. That seems to have been where his efforts have been largely focused. Uh, but he does have a relatively sizable US investment portfolio as well, which we can see in this 13F data. Now, uh, there's only six positions that come through here for Li Lu. We've got uh, Micron, Bank of America, Birch Hathaway, two classes of Google stock and then Apple. So we have uh, kind of six different stocks showing up, really only five different companies considering he's got two classes of Google stock. And the only change that we saw in the quarter was an addition to uh, the class A alphabet or, or Google shares. He added specifically to that share class about 168%. And if we combine the two uh, Google share classes, it now represents about 25% of the portfolio, which would make it it, about the second equal largest position with Bank of America. Now, as I understand it, uh, the largest position in Li Lu's uh, portfolio and his fund is actually, again, BYD. I think just about every investor I've mentioned here owns BYD, and the original idea actually came from Li Lu. That's where Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and uh, Guy Spear and so on kind of heard of that idea. Um, I can't see any recent activity around BYD with Li Lu. It actually dropped off ticker a little a while back but digging through some of the local uh, Chinese regulatory filings a little while back for a, an older video I did on BYD I couldn't see anything to suggest that Li Lu had sold out uh, I think he's just held the shares for quite a long time and there hasn't been sort of a recent filing that would go on to show up here in ticker and outside of that we don't see any other international stock holding data here for Li Lu. Okay now the final investor I want to cover here is one who I haven't talked about on the channel before and that is Brian Lawrence of Oak Cliff Capital. Now Brian Lawrence is actually someone who I came across from just listening to podcasts. Uh, he made a rare appearance last year on the Investors Podcast with uh, Stig Bredesen and uh, his fund Oak Cliff Capital since 2004 so over uh, almost a 20 year period period had returned 718% after fees versus 392% in the S&P 500 and uh, those results are from that 2004 period through to the end of December 2021 so uh, we're a little bit behind on getting some updated numbers there but he seems to invest and think about investments in a way very similar to the people I've covered uh, already in this video you know long-term value investors they tend to take fairly concentrated approaches to investing. So 
betting large portions of their portfolio on each individual company as opposed to spreading it across 20 or 50 or 100 different stocks. And those are the types of investors that I really like to follow. I think they're the people whose 13 Fs we can really read into quite a lot. If someone owns 50 or 100 stocks and we see them add to it in a 13 F, it's really hard to, I think, gauge how much conviction and confidence they have in that particular stock pick. But if they're putting 10 or 20% of their capital into one individual stock, that uh, can definitely suggest that uh, you know it's a stock worth digging into a little further. And interestingly, although Brian Lawrence tends to be concentrated and uh, quite a long-term investor in a small number of companies, unlike some of the other investors that I've covered in this video, he does seem to sort of make quite frequent adjustments around the edges, trimming a little or adding a little to some stocks. But the core portfolio does seem to remain fairly consistent kind of quarter to quarter. So uh, as of the last 13F, he only owns eight positions in his US stock portfolio. Those are Transdime, Interactive Brokers, Google, uh, Star Group, Charter Communications, Guidewire, Gildan Activewear, and Halidor Energy Co. And almost all of those positions have some sort of change. So Transdime, which is about a quarter of the of the pie here for Brian Lawrence, uh, was trimmed about 7%. We have Interactive Brokers, which represents 18% of the portfolio, trimmed 5%. Uh, Google or Alphabet was added to 5%. Star Group Common Stock, no change. Charter Communications added to 20%. Guidewire, no change. Gildan Activewear um, is a brand new stock. Now that represents about 8.5% of the portfolio as of the 13F. And that's a stock I'm actually familiar with from quite a while back uh, from listening to Phil Town of Rule 1 Investing. Phil Town has been in and out of Gildan Activewear many times over the past several years. Uh, he views them as sort of the low cost producer of of clothing largely a commodity kind of low cost um lowish quality clothing that they produce um, but he thinks they are the low cost producer i believe phil town got into the stock when there was a cotton kind of pricing crisis that caused Gildan's cost to spike way up, their earnings to drop way down. It was kind of a short-term uh, issue that Phil Town thought would be ironed out. Uh, and he had pretty good results in the stock, you know, as a result of that underlying thesis. So very interesting to see that pop up here in Brian Lawrence's portfolio as well, uh, as recently as, you know, end of December 22. And we did see two stocks that Brian Lawrence exited altogether. Uh, they were both about 5% positions in the portfolio. One was LGI Homes and one was Alterex Inc. And jumping over to Ticker to look for any potential international holdings, we see absolutely nothing there for Brian Lawrence. So uh, just the kind of US 13F stocks are, are all we can see in his case. So that is our quarterly update of some of my favorite super investors and some of the things that they've been buying and selling in the last quarter. I hope you did enjoy the video. Um, please let me know some of your thoughts in the comments below on uh, some of these moves from our favorite investors. And if you want to see more content here on the channel and haven't subscribed already, please be sure to do so. But that's it from me and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.